Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Rodeo Time, the podcast. This is a very special uh, episode where we've got Mr. Harry Anderson. Doctor. D- yeah, no mister, excuse me. <laughs> doctor. Whatever, just call me. Doctor. Just call him Doc. Harry Anderson. <laughs> yes, the doc. The doc of uh, of feeding. He um, famous for Total Equine. Uh, that's kind of where it started, but Total Feeds mm-hmm. has feed for everything. Total Equine. <clears throat> I was feeding Total Equine to Boone. Uh, this, yeah, this is one story that we didn't tell in the podcast, but um, yeah. So Boone and I, I moved to this area. I live in this area because of all the wheat pasture cattle, and I had three horses. I was helping uh, my brother-in-law. Dr. Wheat Pasture Calves. I had three horses. Uh, one of them, Cripple, Farrier, Hot drivel, hot Nail, whatever. Um, and uh, so I was down to two. You know, and some of those days were really long and you would need two horses for the day or or even just the next day. You, you definitely got to swap them out. So it was Boone and a young horse named Ball. And uh, Boone could not, at the time, he was, you know, 15 and he could not help me doctor more than like three head of calves a day. Of course, you know, it takes me six loops per calf. So that's, I got to chase three calves six times each, 18 chase downs, and he's done, you know. Um, <laughs> so, I, but, but seriously, he was like, he was acting old. And I knew that, you know, there's horses in their 20s at the NFR. Yeah, I'd been on a I'd been on twenty nine year old in the bareback riding, uh, python of Stay Smiths. So, anyways, I knew that horses could perform at an older age. Boone was not, and so I started doing some research. And um, I can't remember. It'd be neat if I remembered like the first way I heard about Total Equine. I think it just might have been around the time you guys were really kicking off your marketing. Yeah, probably no. due to the hard work that Corey Anderson, their marketer lead marketer does yeah it was actually sadie that brought us together but i'm saying no no no. before oh the just me feeding it yeah because you told where me i heard you, about it you told me you did research and you came across our feed but i didn't right because yeah, my younger horse anything. ball like he was one of those horses he was young enough athletic enough i mean you could throw cardboard out there and he was going to go 90 miles an hour you know he was just <clears throat> uh you could feed him anything so but boone was not that way so i found total equine fed it to him and he turned to flip. Um, not literally, thankfully, but he, uh, yeah, a couple days later, it's just like I'm on a new horse and, um, I was able to, he was able to be helpful in the string. And, um, it it was a pretty neat experiment that I got to, got to use on Boone. Now he'll turn 22 in, uh, two weeks. We still use him. He's helped, uh, teach a lot of interns how to ride I picked up on him, you know, I pick up on him every week and, um, yeah, great. It just, it just turned to flip. And then I've got an older horse that's been crippled since I was a kid named Dollar and he is a tank. Yeah, he's big. He, um, he doesn't winter well. So like as winter was coming on, Jordan, uh, my, um, she's in charge of feeding. She, uh, started feeding him just a little extra, maybe like just a few extra pounds of total equine, but his his pin is like behind the round pin, mm-hmm. and so I I didn't see him for you know I mean I would glance at him, but I didn't really right. take. And I went around the corner the other day, and this dude he's the biggest horse we have. Like he looks yeah. like a bucking horse. <laughs> yeah. Did I send you those pictures? Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So anyhow, I'm I'm absolutely a fan of the product. Um, I don't believe in endorsing something that you aren't a fan of. So that's what kind of all my my sponsors, the few that I have, that's how that goes. But uh, this podcast with Dr. Anderson um, is uh, we talk about the feedlot. We talk about nutrition. We talk about his story in getting started with Total Feeds. So, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. If you feed animals, this is of interest to you. Um, or if you just are a fan of, you know, the American dream, and want to hear a story of a family that came up with it, came up with 
and, and lived out the American dream. I mean, from a one room farmhouse on the prairie, one room farmhouse on the prairie. Did it have dirt floors? <laughs> no, no, it, it had it literally had a wooden floor. Gotcha. Yeah, but it was just right. one room. But a grandmother that was born and raised in a sod hut in North yeah. Dakota. Sod hut. Yes, yeah, so it was a big step up. Yeah. Right. It was so, big time. Oh, yeah. There was yeah, wood. Wooden walls around it. <laughs> it <laughs> Love wasn't it. dirt. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, these days they call those studio apartments. Yeah. And you, and you got to pay extra. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of the vintage throwback yeah. of. Yeah. Kind of the, like my Airbnb, Airbnb uh, my, my, the bedroom. Dale B&B out in front of the warehouse. It's here in Newcastle, Texas. Plug. Look us up on, on Airbnb. But, yeah, it's a it's a studio apartment. And that's too bad. I, that thing still wasn't around. I put it in the backyard and rent it out. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And then you charge some, extra. Yeah. Some hipster. <laughs> yeah. Kind of got the industrial feel to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for enjoying this episode of Rodeo Time, the podcast. Now on to the stories. Here we are in the Dale Warehouse. We've got Mr. Harry Anderson, Mr. Corey Anderson. No relation, though, right? <laughs> Slight relation. I'm the yeah. I'm the youngest of two. I'm the little brother. It's the little brother. The younger, better looking. Of the no, t- you know, honestly, uh, no. Uh, my brother was voted best dressed of his senior class. He was always he was always known as the 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 good looking one. Okay, but uh, Dale, he yeah, he, he's he's right. Uh, <laughs> he's right. He, he, he's he's always no no about but the good looking, but about his uh, impeccable dressing. Yeah, that kid was so organized in his attire that he was always looked like he just stepped out of a showroom. And, uh, uh, well, you've seen Corey. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. But, uh, I what? was, I was, you the, throw that in? I was the social, yeah, the social one. And, <laughs> and you guys lived where, when they were growing up? I lived, we started out in Laramie, Wyoming when till he was, uh, Four years old. Eric was eight years old. We moved to liberal Kansas, of all places on the face of this earth. And then we uh, moved back to Jamestown, North Dakota, near our home country, just 80 miles from Mar- where Margaret and I grew up. And then we moved back to Kansas, to Garden City, Kansas. And uh, they were, he was in middle school at that time, and Eric was just graduating. So we moved down here without any kids. Military family, a lot of moving. No, no. <laughs> oh yeah, no. You got to hear the story. It's true. There's a lot of moving, but <laughs> opportunity. Yeah. Feedlots. Feedlot. Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you start with with the okay. farm in, in well, Minnewauk? I, I grew up in northern San, northern North Dakota, right in the center of uh, northern North Dakota, about sixty miles from the <laughs> Canadian border, and uh, it was on an old McDonald's farm. We had dairy cows, beef cows, hogs, chickens, turkeys, da da da, da. And uh, at that time, that's where I got interested in livestock <laughs> ventures to start with because my first business in life was when I was a third grader. I, I went into the chicken business on my own. My parents didn't know it. Okay. It was a secret. Yeah. I was, I was in the third grade. I went, uh, decided I needed to get... Uh, get some chickens. So I saved up my pennies and nickels. At that time, pennies and nickels were a big deal. Uh-huh. And I saved up and I went to the post office and I made, I had the postmaster make a money order to this outfit to buy some chickens. I sent $3 and 85 cents and I got 25 little chicks. Wow. One afternoon I walked in the house after school <laughs> and I heard this cheap chipping and my parents said, uh, do you know anything about this? And I was in the chicken business. So that was my my first venture of animal business. And then I later in life, I went into the chicken business big time. I bought 500 baby chicks one summer when I was uh, like 12 or 13 and uh, uh, stole grain out of my dad's, my parents' granary to feed them. So it didn't cost me anything. <laughs> he and, also slept in the granary. Yes, 
I did. In the summertime, <laughs> they put me out, out of the house because I didn't have a bedroom so that I, I would sleep in the green room in the summertime or in, a, in an old uh, one-room house that I've been born in, but they moved out of. I was born in a one-room house on the prairie. Wow. One room, not one bedroom. One room. There's one. It's one where you open the door, and that's the house. <laughs> Dang. Everybody had to get along. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, no. didn't, I didn't know it because they moved out when I was two years old. I'm not sure How they many got siblings? Old. Just one. One year older. I was the baby. And uh, so there were, they had two, two babies in a run-room house for a while. Wow. And it, but it was, um, it was, we were born in the middle of uh, World War II. So nobody thought anything of it. It, it was just the way it was. And uh, so as, as time went on, I, um, I did get into some other livestock ventures. So I had a, a dairy cow and, and uh, we I raised some other things too, some sheep. And, uh, but that's how it got started. And then uh, when I went to college, I was going to be a uh, chemical engineer. I went to the University of North Dakota and because that, because that, you were a really good student, right? I, uh, <clears throat> well, <laughs> they had to let me in because I was a state resident. Uh, <laughs> it was a technicality. They let him in. <laughs> and that lasted for one semester, and I figured out uh, they didn't want me in that field. Uh, I went in that field because that was the highest paying job coming out of school at that time. I thought, well, I'll just go for the big bucks. doesn't yeah. matter what it is. Uh, so I, I went into psychology, and that lasted one and a half semesters, and and um, that field scared me to death. So at that time, it was when the hippies were just getting lively, and uh, and the professors were hippie types. So I, I so I quit that, and I was going to be an accountant. <laughs> and during this time, the University of North Dakota, uh, great my plan, grades right? were so low that uh, they, they wanted me to leave. <laughs> but so I had to have one semester to get. Like we can't kick you out, but if if you were to leave voluntarily, we will pack your bags and they, lock the door. <laughs> they were about to get rid of me, but um, we uh, uh, I had to get my <laughs> grades up to a C, <laughs> and then I could transfer. So I transferred to North Dakota State University, which is a land grant college up there, and they had the animal science division, and and so I went there and started into animal science and fell in love with that. And from then on, that's all I've thought about was uh, nutrition because the nutrition courses, I got an A in every nutrition course I took at, at that school. And uh, I thought, this is easy. All I need to do is get past uh, uh, chemistry. But I had the great opportunity to take a couple of those courses twice. <laughs> You so, learn more, way more the second time. Yeah. So let's imagine. <laughs> let's go back. So you stumbled on chemistry, but you you went to college with the intention of being a chemical engineer, <laughs> because that was your strong suit. <laughs> well, well, I I didn't have any problem with chemistry in high school, but that's not real difficult. Cause, yeah. But in high school, I I uh, ended up graduating in the bottom third of a class of fourteen. Probably voted the least likely to succeed if they would have done that voting. My Margaret always says that that I'm sure he would have been. Yeah, <laughs> that's my mom. Yeah, she was there too. She, yeah, she, she was uh, in one one grade behind me in in school. But uh, so it it was um, I don't know not a planned path if you want to put it that way. Everything became accidental because even at uh, North Dakota State. I, uh, I, the first couple, uh, the first year I struggled pretty hard cause I was working 40 hours a week in the hog barn. That's how I went to school, 75 cents an hour and, uh, went to school. Uh, but, but that got up to a dollar and a quarter before I graduated. <clears throat> I thought it was big time, but, uh, my first year was quite a struggle. I didn't do well, but at the end of my first year, I got married from then on, for some reason, it was straight A. I never have figured that out. What that, how that happened? But yeah, if you've <laughs> there met, was a stimulus there. You met my mother. You can figure that yeah. out real quick. But, but uh, <laughs> so, but then uh, when I was getting done with school, uh, uh, I had good grades by that time, and I had a background, and I got to looking around at jobs, and boy, there was nothing that 
sounded interesting to me. I could have been a bank rep. I could have been an assistant county agent or something like that. Nothing wrong with that. But that just wasn't my cup of tea. And one day I was standing in the hallway at, um, in the animal science office, and one of the graduate students that I was visiting with, he said, do you see that on the bulletin board? And I said, see what? He said, look at that. He said, South Dakota State, there's a, there's a fellowship available for um, uh, $3,200 a year to go to graduate school in nutrition. I said, <laughs> okay. Um, but I wrote a letter to them, and for some reason I wrote right back and said, can you come? So I, without planning, took, um, well, at, we had one, one child at the end of my bachelor's, that was Eric, and so I packed him and Margaret up, and we went to South Dakota State, and I spent four years there getting a Ph.D. in, in uh, swine nutrition, actually, but also a minor in physiology and a minor in biochemistry and took a bunch of uh, pharmacology courses along the way. I never would take a PUD course, you know, elective course. My electives were something like an extra chemistry course or something like that. I fell in love with studying, and the rest is history. I got out... Um, um, with uh, without any job, at that time there were sixty five applicants for every job for a PhD, <laughs> and, and so finally I'd, I had a friend that went ahead of me, graduated, went ahead of me to the University of Wyoming, and was on staff there. And he called and said, "Hey, there's an opening out here. You better apply." So I ended up being a livestock specialist in the state of Wyoming, general livestock specialist. And with uh, <coughs> emphasis in dairy, <laughs> I was a swine nutritionist. But nonetheless, I went out there and I've worked with all, all species for about three years. And then uh, Purina came along and offered me a job as a feedlot consultant. I'd never heard of a feedlot. See, all these things kind of happened ahead of me, and, and I didn't know what was coming. And so they, they said, if you want to be a feedlot nutritionist, uh, you know, come and apply. So I did, got the job. And they sent me out to the feed yard uh, of Western Kansas. You've seen those. I'd never seen one. I did not know really how they operated, but I was a feedlot specialist. Yeah, but that's that's probably you knew a lot about nutrition. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's probably the best way to do it because I feel like it would be better to have someone like yourself in there you know, designing nutrition rather than someone who thinks they know a lot about feedlots because they'd been on a processing crew for six months in the summertime mm. as a 14 year old kid, you know, which is my, like that was, <laughs> that sounds like your resume. Whenever I'm having a bad day, I think about, um, working for, I don't want to say his name, but there was, you know, it, it was a guy in feedlot and well, I mean, it's it's not a bad thing. I guess I could say his name. It, it was just a crummy job for me, you know. He was a good boss. But uh, the point is, is like it was graveyard shift of uh, of working a um, <clears throat> processing crew. So not even getting to be horseback. But I couldn't drive. I was like 14 years old. And uh, we went there. <clears throat> My brother and sister and I, they were in a bind for getting some uh, – um, they just had a big load of cattle. I guess I think he had had a crew quit. I later found out why. Um, <laughs> they, he had a and and so my old man being the ag teacher, they call. Hey, y'all have anybody? Well, I got these three kids, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we go and work, you know, a couple nights, and um, and then I stayed and continued to work as a fourteen year old in this feedlot, and it got to where I mean, this guy was he was a worker. Um, he also appreciated, you know, strong drink. And so I would have to drive him sometimes. But we would leave. We would get done processing 6, 7 in the morning. And then we would go do fence work down the road for another 3, 4, 5 hours. And then he'd take me home after lunch. And, um, yeah, I, rem <laughs> I remember uh, doing the math. We were in his truck, and he was got his and he was trying to write me a check and 
he uh, he couldn't get the math right, and so I had to like do the math for him on how many hours I was. There. <laughs> so I had to drive him there, and he just he he not only was in the right state of mind to drive, but he also had a hard time writing a check. <laughs> so I had to do the math for him. And it wasn't long after that that my old man was like, "Why don't you just not go to work?" Anymore. <laughs> but anyway uh, it's a tough thing for a father to say to a son <laughs> right <laughs> especially you know like a son who's wanting to work yeah. you know and it's manual labor yeah, but and he threw you to this wolf <laughs> i didn't real like <clears throat> i mean i'm 14 years old and i get i get i pull up after an 18 hour day at 14 years old and uh i just thought it was the i thought that's what you did i thought that's what you know um, we didn't work 18 hours. It's real grown-up stuff. That's what I, I... I didn't even think it was like... Now, looking back, I'm like, what the hell were you doing? You know, like, you should be playing football. You should be... Now, I didn't do that forever. That job wasn't... It was It was short-lived. Yeah, I bet it was. However, like, looking back, it's like it gives me perspective on other things. Like, I oh, remember yeah. vividly sitting in the front yard and this this man trying to write a check, and I had to... Take it, you know, we didn't have calculators on our phones then, but I had to do the math. I had to write it out, you know, and write the check for him and then get out of the driver's seat and go inside and uh, write the check for me. <laughs> I let him sign it. But anyhow, my my experience in the feedlot was, uh, was maybe one of the worst jobs that I think you could make processing fun if you have the right kind of boss and attitude and what, what have you. But I, I, I grown I, I grew to appreciate it later in life, you know. Um, whenever we in, later in high school, we did an event called the Commercial Steers. Okay. Yes. At stock shows, mm -hmm. if you frequent my podcast, you've heard me talk about it. But I'm a pretty large advocate. You don't halt or break them. It recreates a feedlot scenario. And at Houston, it's a pin of three. At San Antonio, it's a pin of two. In Amarillo, it's a pin of three, and you do a record book. Um, when you get there, you're graded on four things. Number one is the performance of the cattle, which that's 25% of your overall score. A written test is 25%. A record book is 25%. And then Houston, it's an oral interview. San Antonio, it's a speech. Amarillo, it's an oral interview. That's 25%. So it's four things. 75% is based on your knowledge of the industry. That's great. Through the written test, the oral interview, and the record book. But you're, they're graded. The cattle performance is, is gain, right? Um, it's everything. Efficiency. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, like, um, yeah, like each little line, line item in your record book, mm -hmm. cost to gain, um, feed conversion, average daily gain. They'll actually grade. My sister just did it in, um, at Houston. Right. 4%. Of the steers there graded prime and two out of three of her daughters were were prime and um big 1450 pound steers oh, I bet. oh man I, I need to show you the video but essentially like but at the end of the day that's only 25 percent of the score mm -hmm. the other 75 percent is based on that person's knowledge of the industry whatever the point is all through high school my dad was a whiz at this program and so I got to learn a lot about the feedlot oh, industry. I, I felt yeah. like a lot more so than someone who might just halt or break a ten thousand dollar show calf. <laughs> yeah. um, but we would get docked. You couldn't spend that much on a calf in the commercial steers because you would get docked because it's not realistic. You no. know. Sure. Anyway, well, um, he can talk all day about that. And, I, and, and yeah. honestly, that's you know, that's really how total feeds. Is run too because we still have that mentality. Oh yeah, we we still. Uh, I've I spent thirty five years as a feedlot consultant, walking through feedlot pen seven <laughs> days a week, telling them what to do, da, da, you know, and what to change, and and uh, being graded on feed efficiency. So yeah. was it was it always <laughs> strictly like just the nutrition the side, or did you like were you like bunk reading and? Um, no, I didn't. I didn't do the bunk reading. I. See, I would just uh, con contract or, went, well, before I, I went private, uh, the first years I worked for Purina, and, and I would uh, go to a feed yard, look over the records, and check the mill and, and tell them 
you know, what they're doing right and wrong at that time and come back a month <laughs> Make later. Make sure the actual ration right. is where and it needs to be. And then I would formulate the rations or change the ration if I needed to. And and at that time, I got up to where I was probably uh, consulting with about 500, 600,000 head of cattle at, at any given day. <clears throat> and then uh, we, uh, we, we uh, left the feedlot business for a while and went to North Dakota as I, I worked as a district manager or sales rep for Purina, mm. which was probably my best training that I had. Completely along different job than nutrition. Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, Just was, the yeah. only common denominator is that you are Who selling the check. feed. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, right. And he, he jumped in with both feet. And I'll tell you, I still tell people when I'm on the road, he's, this is a head of sales. Did they did they hire you for that job because they needed someone for that job, or they felt like your skills? It was be- simply an opening that uh, I was well. Three years on my first go round in the feedlot business just about burned me out. I, I was at the end of my rope. I was physically, mentally wore out, and they saw that, <clears throat> and they said, "Hey, we've got this little district in North Dakota that's open up." And you might be interested in going going there. It's going to be four counties that, no, 11 counties that you'll work in. And that 11 counties, nothing, you know. I can buzz around that, get all over in one day. So I go up, and the first year went well. The second year went better. And the third year, they gave me 52 counties. Dang. Congratulations. Yeah. You're not going home again. <laughs> My pay didn't go up. But I've got 52 <laughs> counties to have an opportunity. And I was working all the way from almost from Grand Forks, North Dakota, to um, Rapid City, South Dakota, living in the center. Kind of. And um, about four years later, it got burned out, so I just about did go down. I was in the hospital and everything else. And uh, they said, uh, the person that replaced you in Kansas as a FELA consultant quit. Would you like to go back? So, <laughs> so back I go. <laughs> and so we go back to Garden City, Kansas. Let's see, steady paycheck, uh, no yeah. more six-foot snow drifts to walk yeah. through. Uh, <laughs> well, at that time, North Dakota was also in a total economic loss. They terrible. were at the bottom of the, the last area in the country to go through a recession at that time, and there was no money in North Dakota, and they no quit jobs. buying feed. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah, and so I go back and... Uh, they said, come back down. We've got a four-county area for you to work. Yeah. Within two years, I was working in four states. District managers were calling me and asking for help. I said, you've got a nutritionist. Can you just quietly come over and help me? And so I was working several different <coughs> areas for them. And uh, there again, it was getting to be an awful lot of work, but I was I was working with uh, probably seven, 800,000 head of cattle, seven days a week. And so what, what was it? Because you, what I remember is you being, even back then, being kind of a maverick <laughs> in, as far as nutrition. Well, that, that's putting it mildly. Because um, uh, you had a philosophy even back then for right. nutrition. Uh, my cohorts and my bosses uh, – did not believe in what I was using in the feedlot. I was doing things that they just said wouldn't work. But the okay. cattle in the feedlots I was working with were performing better than other feed yards. The cost of gain was better. The efficiency was better and all that. But they still said I, I was doing things wrong because I was using things that uh, they didn't approve of. It wasn't conventional. And so it got to the point where uh, I, I got crosswise with who was writing my But paycheck. it was working. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was working. I, I was, mean, that I was, was the whipping everybody line. with performance. I, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the little, I think it was, it would have been my sophomore or junior year. Anyway, I, my sister was, is really, really smart in the, I, I believe she could probably manage a feedlot. Um, but she uh, she was great with commercial steers, and um, I was really good at waking up early and being like the mule, you know. Like I enjoyed that 
part of it. I enjoyed the the sweat side of it rather than the intellectual side of it. <laughs> um, so I was kind of tasked with feeding, you know, everything. And I just, I liked getting that checked off my list. Wake up early, feed everything. <clears throat> so, but, but we were feeding, um, steam flaked corn. Oh yeah. And, um, you know, it doesn't have a very long shelf life, like three or four days. So, but I, I felt, I really, really liked it as, you know, feeding these steers. And um, may, maybe because it also smelled good to me. But, tastes, tastes good, too. Yeah. Well, I did try it. I don't oh. remember it tasting all that great. But, <laughs> um, but I had to take this. It's I had frosting. This, this Studebaker trailer. <laughs> like, it was a Studebaker truck bed trailer. Uh-huh. I still have it. It's at the ranch. And um, I had a 79 one-ton Ford flatbed pickup, single cab. Uh, it was white with a green stripe on the top. We called it the Skid Mark. And, uh, yeah, I would pull that Studebaker trailer to Headley, Texas, 11 miles away to Crow Hollow Feedlot. And uh, Bob, the manager, would, uh, when they, that front end loader, they got to where they recognized me, the guy running the front end loader in the mornings, loading feed into those those uh, feed trucks. And I would just pull in there, and he would fill that sucker up. I'd run across the scales and go back. And, yeah, it was a couple times a week, but I, I'd have to leave the house around 6, 6.15 in the morning. Anyhow, she ended up winning San Antonio, but like I said, the the, the cattle were twenty five percent. It ended up being one of the factors that helped her win, and uh, they were both prime one. And uh, they grade them live, and then they'll send you the grade oh, off wow. the rail yeah. later. They uh-huh. also send you like the, sure. the U.S. and yeah. it was prime one live, prime one on the rail, and uh, they 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 did the sonogram i mean the uh, ultrasound not sonogram <laughs> they ultrasounded the yeah. ribeye area and everything anyhow um so each of the four categories that my sister did well in the the performance of the cattle test speech and uh record book they would give like these pins that were like nice wooden pin in a case with inscribed and uh, so i got the pin for the cattle like like literally like a writing pen. That was my. But you didn't know how to write. <laughs> but but it was funny because like like I was blessed with the knowledge that I got to learn throughout. Did not do well, you know. Probably like give middle at the middle of the pack at best. Give the wooden pen to the grunt. My dad was mad at me because I I'd forgotten my um my jacket like a blazer. Yeah. And a tie. Like I looked like the feed hand when I was given <laughs> given my speech. But uh, but my sister won, you know, the best performing cattle of the whole show. And so, uh, yeah, that, you know, she, she won a scholarship and a buckle and all this. But just for that one that one segment, she got that pen. She handed it to me at the end. That was my reward for feeding out those calves. But I did, I came to really um, value, like, not only what you're feeding, but the consistency in like the time of day, um, like paying attention to, you know, how much you're feeding, you know, that 3% rule, 3% of their body weight. And I I became a fan of it. And uh, now that we're feeding out calves to eat, you know, it's, it's come in handy that I've got that knowledge, but. uh, But you would have been easy to work with and because you appreciate that stuff. A lot of people I worked with were didn't. No. I, I very I love to uh, grow beef, meaning like Good. like our cow calf operation. Like I'm I I love to. I won't keep them all the way through the stalker phase, but um, here locally at Graham, if you you know they'll do a weaned calf sale, and so. At the first Monday of every month, they do a weaned calf sale. And so if you have uh, 45 days weaned calves, and so I'll absolutely feed them through that, get a little bit of a premium, and, you know, we'll make we'll make a little bit more money per head. It, it, it doesn't come out to be a huge, but I just love it so much that I, I just, my problem is sometimes I'm, I call myself a sympathy feeder. You know, <laughs> okay. like if it's cold. That's a new one to me. <laughs> if it's cold. Or something like I'll just 
pour extra feed. Oh, good. If it's it, it doesn't really happen whenever I'm feeding out like steers, but like cows or horses, like if I go out to you know the pasture, like you just don't feed cows every day. But I will pour some cubes to some cows <laughs> if they come up and look hungry, and they may not need it. But yeah, sympathy Those feeder. brown eyes looking at you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why you don't name them. <laughs> my, my old man would let us name horses. But we do not name yeah. beef. Yeah. You yeah. put a name on it and so yeah, my mom's dad uh raised cattle and he he named them all after the women in the ladies uh aid group in the church. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't go over well. That got embarrassing once in a while. <laughs> yeah. But he would my mom would tell stories about she and her friend would go hide in the uh you know, in the trees, they had these hedgerows and stuff, and he would be down there singing to the cows. Didn't eat one of them. Yeah, all had names. He couldn't couldn't eat them. <laughs> my, uh, Sold them all. <laughs> I don't remember how old man got a hold of this like painted up bull that turned into a bottle calf. Um, I think he had like some sale barn ca- uh, cows at one point, but anyhow, this little orphan doggy calf. Uh, was a paint bull and and ended up being a bottle calf and my mom called him Wallace and uh, he uh, he was around the house and just we had like an acre and a half of fence around the house mm-hmm. you know like there wasn't like a, a a yard fence that was just you know like a hundred a thousand square feet it was like an acre so like. Right. We had a donkey, and Wallace would walk around in this acre. So they might be on the front porch when you come out. Right. <laughs> um, well, Wallace got like eight, nine hundred pounds, out. thousand pounds. You know, big animal. I don't remember vividly, but he was uh, he was just large, and he got to where he would play, but he would play a little too rough, like you know, because he's just he had come up a bottle calf where they'll nudge yes. you and he kept that <laughs> they'll up. They'll knock you down. And they'll kind of knock you oh, down, yeah. and like you pull up and get out of your vehicle and it's the dog the mini donkey and wallace standing there <laughs> like it's a big animal like you're trying to make it to the house and wallace <laughs> wants to play well by the time he's a thousand pounds that's yeah. a little different than a jack russell you know <laughs> and so we <laughs> we had to sell wallace and uh so my dad took wallace to the sale barn and uh he got back and uh <clears throat> he said to my mom it's like how how did it go? You know, it's like oh, it was good. You know, he was you know, gentle went in there, and you know, I'm I'm pretty sure one of those order buyers like they they bought him as a herd bull, <laughs> and uh, my mom was like my mom yeah. was like oh that's yeah. good, yeah. and kind of looked away, and my dad looked at me and went. <laughs> it shook his head. <laughs> it was maybe a week before Wallace was on somebody's plate. Yes, maybe a week. Uh, and uh, we got any more of that Wallace in the freezer? Yeah, exactly. So I, uh, yeah, I try not to name an animal. If oh. there's a chance I know I'm going to have to sell it or cut him loose, I try not to name beef. I didn't have that problem. I I showed uh, we had Jersey, Jersey cows, and I always showed uh, Jersey heifers at four H and so. On. And this one one year, the last one I had actually, she was really a good heifer, and and the judge was very complimentary. And he said that that heifer could go anywhere in the United States and stand well on a show. Well, she uh, became pregnant. She had a calf, and we milked her, but she wouldn't breed back. Just wasn't going to breed back. So I poured the grain to her. She tasted really good. We had her for lunch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Didn't bother me yeah. in the least. <laughs> we had uh, Rickle. I had a, a herd bull, and I throw him in. I mean, they're all bucking bulls. You know, we would buck him. So he runs with bucking bulls. And I had one bucking bull, uh, New Mexico bad boy, and he did get Rickle down and, anyways, dislocated or broke his leg or something. So we had to take him, you know, and it was uh, – that was a little – I mean, it was – I did it. But we gave a lot of the meat away. I still have some rickle. In the- <laughs> Donnie thinks it's hilarious. He'll bring it up. Like we'll be. This is rickle. <laughs> we'll be eating burgers. It's like is this rickle? <laughs> rickle with a pickle. That's yeah. right. Well, well, we had another bull when we first started named Dickle, Rickle and Dickle, and uh, 
Oh, I, I, I could have just gone there, I right. suppose. Yeah, but Dick, <laughs> Dick, Dickle died, and so we just had Rickle. Did you eat him? No, he, like, died out in the pasture. Ah. Yeah, yeah, it would have been, yeah. But, um, yeah, we it took us a couple of days before we found him, but uh, anyhow. What's... What are you working on there? Yeah, Dad? what you got? What you right now? <laughs> well, well it, I was I was just there. going to uh, kind of mention <clears throat> during you know he he said I was a maverick. And, oh yeah, and that's nutrition, true. absolutely. Uh, but I, I I designed some different things in the feed yard industry that they hadn't done before because I was an outsider. I I didn't know the convention. I didn't know how you were supposed to do things. So exactly, that <clears> was my point yeah. earlier, and that's been my. Uh, my best asset as I went through life. Right. Yeah. Go into new things and look from the outside and say, Hey, I can, I can do that different. Right. Well, you knew about nutrition, but right. you weren't, you weren't like boxed in by the stereotypes right. of a feedlot. Yeah, right. That's like, I would probably be, if I knew anything about nutrition, which I don't, but if I went into the feedlot right now, I would probably try to fit it in a box. Yeah. Well, um, one of yeah, the, what, what is everybody else doing? Yeah, exactly. I'll just do that. One of the things was uh, the that I, I still pretty proud of, it, and that is in the conventional way of starting cattle in the feed yard, as you probably well know, is you put them on silage or hay, then you add a little grain, you add a little more grain, a little more, a little more each day, and and by the time you're they've been there three weeks, you might have them on hot feed. Okay, that's conventional. I started a program where I had them on hot feed in ten days from the feed. From the sale barn. And that does sound pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was because of customer. I'm in the process of transitioning some right now. Mm -hmm. I've drug it out a little bit just because no particular reason other than, like, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> I forget, I forget to, to transition. Like, <laughs> But I, I designed a program where they started with uh, the, the so-called starting program, you know, with a little Starter bit of grain and the, and the silage and hay in there. Right. And then start adding uh, more of the finishing ration every day for 10 days, and all of a sudden they were on feed, and the, the cattle were fine, didn't know it, no belly aches or anything like that. And, and, and they said, you can't do that. And I had hundreds of thousands of cattle starting that way. Right. So uh, what percentage corn on that on that 10th day of the ration? 80. What, 80. 80 what, plus. And then did you have to add in like a, a remensin supplement? Well, they all used remensin at that time. And that's, that's another thing that uh, uh, along the way I did some research and helped design some research that got me in serious trouble with some companies. Um, I proved that uh, uh, you could feed cattle with high fat and without remensin and get better performance and less digestive problems. I proved that you could use a microbial, uh, daily microbial, uh, that you put in the diet and um, get better performance with that and less digestive problems than with remensin. Guess guess who took after me and tried to put me out of business? <laughs> right, I can only imagine. And uh, maybe a I, former employer. Yeah, no, no, one of the drug companies. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the maker of remensin. Gotcha. They they had a hit a hit man on me, but and I also proved that all of these. Uh, um, a drug that was commonly used for years and years and years for heat suppression in the feed yard so the heifers don't cycle because cycling heifers don't eat well and they don't gain well, all that kind of stuff, injuries. Um, I proved that by feeding high fat in the ration, which I also proved you could feed twice as much fat as what was conventional. And once you did that, you stopped heat cycling and we didn't need that drug anymore. And that company lost hundreds of thousands of head of cattle on that program because it wasn't needed. But yeah, this these weren't small changes in the industry. <coughs> no, but they're monsters. But he was coming at it, as you pointed out, as a nutritionist. I'm like, well, what if we what if we modify the diet to make the animal healthier in this environment <clears throat> instead of, you know. There's the standard diet that you have to feed, and the cattle are in this environment, and they're getting sick. So can you give us a drug that, that you know, turns that around? <laughs> Where he was like, well, what, why don't we start with the diet? Yeah, so change the diet, not <laughs> add a drug. And then uh, one of the other things that never, never took off, but uh, 
uh, it was fun to prove it. And that was uh, one of the feed companies later in my career, not long before I was done, came out with a uh, supplement that you could feed with no roughage. It was simply steam flake corn, like you were feeding, and uh, uh, no roughage at all. And this feed yard that I was working for, they came to him, gave him a bunch of feed and said, I want you to take this half of your feed yard, which is about 10,000 head, and put them on our program. And the feed yard manager t said to me, he said, can you do that without that supplement? Can you make a program like that that I can try on this side of the feed yard, the other half of the feed yard? I said, yeah. So we took all the cattle off roughage in that feed yard. And uh, the cattle that, that I have them, that I designed the program for beat that feed company. And I didn't have any magic potion in it or anything else. I didn't put anything in it special. Uh, and uh, so that, that was something that, that was never going to be accepted by the feed yard industry. They're too dangerous. So what, did it, what about total feeds? When did that come? Total feeds came about um, in 2008. No, yeah, well, 2012. Well, the corporation, but I, I think you need to go back. To Precursor. It, what started was was the formula, the original. Yes, totally uh, equine. I, I was a independent consulting nutritionist, and I was going down the road. And one day, this uh, uh, veterinarian, he was a USDA veterinarian, had some horses, and he came to me and he said, "Can you design a feed, one rep, one formula that will feed every horse in the world?" I said, I laughed at him. I said, "You you really got to be kidding." That just isn't conventional. I said, have you been in a oh, store no. and looked at uh, the number for Purina and Neutrina and how many formulas they have? Twenty At that time, it was probably around 20 formulas each company had for horses. That was, that was crazy talk. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, that was ludicrous to even ask that question. And But I said, of course, in my true fashion, I said, yes, I can. So <laughs> in the year 2000, I sat down I one day. I had a piece of paper, and I said, okay, now, what, what does a horse need? To, and uh, what have I seen in the literature for nutrient levels and so on? And, and so I, I wrote that formula on a piece of paper in the year 2000, and it's exactly the same formula today in 2022. But he didn't take it. Pardon? The, the veterinarian. Well, it, he used it for a while, and he wanted me to, to sell it. He wanted to sell it. So he wanted me to sell it, pick it up, deliver it to the place, and collect the money and give him some money. <laughs> Sounds like a great deal for him. That was a partnership. <laughs> and <laughs> worked great for just, just oh, a couple months. And, yeah. and I'll give you this wooden pen. Yeah, I had a guy call me <laughs> from North Dakota, and he was like, hey, man, I can make you a bit. And I was like, okay. And he was like, I want to design a bit. And then I got a place in Mexico. Same people that make the cow puncher bits. And what we'll do is we'll send this design down there. You'll sell it on your website, and then we'll split the money. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> that is brilliant. I've been, I've been waiting for this phone call. But the problem, <laughs> like it start like a buddy of mine was like, hey, this guy wants to talk business. And so it's crazy because it's, it's almost like, Phone calls like that, people like that. A buddy of mine was talking to me. He said, I can imagine you get a lot of those where it's like watching a four-year-old look at a tractor. You can see them look into the sky thinking, formulate a plan, and then they look to their parent. <laughs> can I go? And before they even finish this, you're like, no, you cannot go drive that tractor. You know, like <laughs> that's what it's like with people like that. Like on the phone, I'm just, I can see this idea of formulating and I, I really just want to cut them off and say, look, man, I got some stuff I got to take. <laughs> you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm getting robbed. Let me let you go. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, but, but that was my second partnership and yeah. Uh, and that didn't work. <clears throat> but I, you know, he didn't know how to run total feeds. He didn't know how to run a feed company and, and make a distributorship. I mean, right. He's a nutritionist. He's a nutritionist by trade. Yeah. Yeah. I was he, delivering feed uh, for the yes. for eight years. I, uh, I I graduated from a, 
I first started delivering it in a 16 foot bumper pull trailer. I could get two pallets in there. And I've, so I was delivering with that and that worked okay. And then all of a sudden, um, I couldn't get enough in there. So I got a 20 foot gooseneck that I could get, uh, four pallets in. It was just a sing, single wheel axle, a uh, single wheel dual. I mean, single wheel dual tandem. axle. Tandem. Yeah. And it, anyway, then that got too small. So I had a special built trailer, 24 foot triple X with, uh, three 8,000 pound axles under it. And I could get nine pallets in there. And you needed a football field to turn it. <laughs> yeah. But I was delivering feed, consulting and delivering feed. And yeah. So delivering your own feed. Yeah. One by one, I was stacking it in people's barns. So he's, he didn't quit his day job as, oh, no. as a nutritionist. No, <clears throat> He's just, while he's going I'm, to feed lot to feed I had lot, some hours left. Yeah. <laughs> he's pulling this trailer full of feed in a plain white bag. No label on it. So yeah. that was what year? Well, that was been, uh, I was doing that from year 2000 until 2008, nine, I guess. How old were you in 2000, if you don't mind me asking? I was born 44. Was 43. 50, or 43. 50, yeah, I was 57. 57. Man, <clears throat> to, all the, to all the 22-year-olds out there that think they're behind. Uh-huh. Well, you get, Harry Anderson was 57 years old whenever I, he started Total Feeds. Well, actually, when I started Total Feeds, uh, we had, had I had kind of gotten on some bad times with consulting and everything. I was kind of inching away from that, and kind of the money was running out. So we were down to uh, basically living on Margaret had a job. Thank heavens. And um, she uh, she was the director of the United Way. Yeah. She so no, yeah, and, and she got her degree. This is a side note, a month before I did. So she was my age. She 50 was fifty years old. years old when she finished her degree and started her career. <laughs> we didn't bloom. We did no, not bloom were. till late in life. So I don't. Did y'all just go ahead and use the same gown to graduate <laughs> with? <laughs> we dra- graduated in two different schools. So. Uh, well, <clears throat> me and my old man graduated uh, the exact same day. <laughs> Are you serious? Uh huh. <laughs> That's awesome. Man. We walked the stage next to each other that's pretty cool <laughs> with with our our masters so like he had gone he, ha, he yeah. had a bachelor's oh, and then yeah. he had gone to tcu ranch management and then uh anyways we got our masters <laughs> that's it, cool. it was really it was a neat it was a neat moment neat so day. there <laughs> he's knee deep in this he, he's in his 60s by now and and they're living off my mom's paycheck and then she quit and she retired and it was at this point he's like you know what <laughs> you know what margaret I think I should cash in all the money I have for retirement and put it toward this crazy uh, feed that I have in a plain white bag. I really think it's a good idea. (laughs) We ended up living on our Social Security checks because we were already eligible for Social Security when we started it. Wow. Yeah. You had an AARP card. (laughs) Oh, no, that was 15 years earlier. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Were there people telling you not to do it? Nobody tells me well, not to do anything. Yeah, I mean, I guess at that point. His you're, accountant. You're 56. <laughs> yeah, but, my accountant. She, so, can get, she can get by with it. I guess the reason it makes me say that is I think it was seven years ago, my my grandparents, people in my family literally said, you need to start thinking about getting a real job. Oh. Seven or eight years ago. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm I glad did. I didn't because now I'm able to give 15, 16 people a real job <laughs> exactly you're supporting yeah, people yeah. i remember his accountant saying that and and like you you know doing his taxes and like well you're not there's no positive <clears throat> money right yeah, yeah. you're spending you're not making every, any money you're spending all of the money that you make to to stay on the road and yeah. and make more feed and uh not to mention your heart Oh, well, that little side deal, yeah, in the year 2008, uh, I was just getting this thing rolling good, and, and um, I uh, had open-heart surgery. They had to fix my mitral valve. And so I, uh, it was in mid-July, mid to late July, then I had the surgery, and he said, no, uh, maybe six weeks, you kind of do some light work and stuff. Three weeks later, I was delivering feed, and uh, I had to to survive. So I got over that and and got down the road a ways, 
And then we moved at down, we moved Texas fall of 2010. Yeah. Two weeks after I got here, they diagnosed me with stage four colon cancer. Oh, dang. I forgot and about that. For those so, of you that don't know, there's no stage five. No. <laughs> <laughs> they said that after year, several years afterwards, my on, oncologist said, you do realize that there's only 5% survival rate on that, yeah. don't you? I said, well, really? I'm a professional, right? Yeah. And, but we got over that. Um, with with the chemo and chemo. surgery. Yeah, yeah, it was chemo. not. But it was during yeah. that time, we doubled our business. Dang. I was sitting year. in a in a house there in Weatherford, and a rented house. Yeah, a rented house, and we doubled our business that year and made a lot of money. Probably as good of money as I ever made. It hasn't been that good since. No, I'm just kidding. But then, then <laughs> I, uh, I, a couple of years later, um, I had to have a um, mitra clip on my heart, and uh, no, that came later. Uh, a couple of years later, I had to have a valve replacement. Yeah. So they opened me up and put a new, I put a cow valve. He's got a cow heart. valve in there. Yeah. And then a year later, I had to have a mitra clip, which to fix something that didn't work right on my mitral valve. And then a couple of years later than that, I, <laughs> I had an ablation because <laughs> my heart was not the the wiring wasn't working right, so they had to go in and reset the wiring, and so I'm pretty good now. Yeah, he's got what? he's got Rickles valve. Aside from <laughs> aside from open heart surgery and uh, cancer and having to deal with Corey's BS, what's been your <laughs> biggest struggle as an entrepreneur? Maybe something that surprised you, or maybe it didn't surprise you. Throughout these last 22 years of growing Total Feeds, what's been your biggest hurdle to overcome? I want to hear him narrow that down. Oh, boy. Uh, you know, I'm not even sure. Well, there, have been, there have been several little stumbling blocks along the way. Uh, a lot of it is uh, people taking advantage of what I'm doing. Um, I had a, two partners when I first started. The, the, they extruded for them in 2008, and... Um, that cost a bunch of money to get rid of them because uh, they wanted to steal my formula and, and uh, go off and do their own thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to hire the toughest two attorneys in Austin to get them off my back. And so that cost me fifteen or $20,000, which isn't bad, I guess, in today's society. Uh, but once we got that behind us, it is when you're starting a business by yourself. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. In the early it's days, it was kind of, of tough. But uh, I guess the the major thing is, and 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 it's this is common in the industry, any in industry. That's copycats. Yep. Since we started that, there are at least eight oh, yeah. copycats <laughs> in the United States. Absolutely. That claim they have the same feed as I do. Now, mm -hmm. No one has uh, stepped up and uh, said, ha can prove, show me that, that their customers are happier after they change to theirs for mine. I mean, it can uh, literally, I remember one came out in California, it's literally, you could take our label and their label. They're just, it's a photocopy of our label. Yeah. But they still can't get the formula dialed in. <laughs> but it's the same, you know, they're, word for they're word. They're missing a few things is what they're doing. Yeah. So what's, what's next for Total Feeds? What's your next big um, goal or vision, or how do you, where do you see Total Feeds in five or ten years? Well, uh, I think we're going to have to work on something and expand the kinds of products we sell. Uh, we'll continue to grow with Total Feeds. We're we're a long ways from Total Equine. We're a long ways from where that could go. We've got a couple other products that need to grow, like Total Canine. <laughs> Uh, our total canine is starting to grow. I just looking at my numbers yesterday that we're up about uh, 40% this year from what we were last year already. Yeah, and we had we had Chewy reach out to us yes. <coughs> for the horse feed because they 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 told us flat out like, well, we've got a market that we didn't understand. You know, we're selling all this dog food to these young women and some of them have horses and your product keeps coming up. Um is this extruded feed with it's different and we think it's a good fit. We we've seen your marketing. It's a good fit. And then, so that got us in the door and now we're selling the dog food. So they didn't come to us for the dog food, but you know, nice. 
That's how we got the dog that's, food. That's going well in Chewy. Yeah. At a very <laughs> high price. <laughs> but people are buying it. They, yeah. They're buying convenience, and but they like the product. And they're in places where I don't have dealers. Yeah. And that has really helped our market get into some of those locations. <laughs> and then one of the big things that we just got started is we finally got across that border to the north. We got into Canada with dog food uh, two weeks ago. And... Uh, uh, the first report is, and they've been working on this. Actually, someone in Canada did all the legwork to get it approved to go up there. That's how bad they wanted it. Wow. And their the horse feed isn't quite ready to get in there yet, but they say it's not very far away. But the dog food got cleared, so they sent some up there. The, the uh, It's an interesting story because uh, these guys were so excited that he, called, he sent a text. He said, uh, it's here. My dogs love it. He said, I put your food beside the food they've been eating for several years, side by side in pans. And he said, they won't touch their old food. They're eating total canine and they will not touch their old food. And so, and that was uh, last week. The other day I, I texted him. I said, um, how's it going? He said, well, we just about sold out of everything we shipped up here. <laughs> That's what well, was in two weeks. Well, and- and you guys have probably heard this from people if you've ever talked to people on the road uh, about total feeds. And we, pre COVID, we were doing like uh, 30 some shows a year, 30 yeah. to 40 shows At a least year. 30. Mm-hmm. And the number one question where do I get the feed? We're always trying to grow our dealership, we're trying to grow capacity. It's, it's a nightmare right now. You know, it's, I'm paying, it's almost $5 a gallon for diesel right now. You know, it, it affects everything. So that's our biggest hurdle, and we, we've reached out to new plants and stuff, but that's um, – it's never been about demand for us. It's no. been about um, trying uh, to break that how supply How to meet chain. the demand. <coughs> we, we, we signed up two new plants to make feed for us last year. Now we have four nationwide, um, one in California, one in Texas here at Munster, uh, one in Butler, Missouri, and one in Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, they, they come on and they, they help us reach into a new market because of ge- ge- geography, for one thing, and uh, better, better shipping cost to the area that they're in. So we have that ability to expand now. So we're, we're sitting here looking in, into, through the doorway into some uh, expansion as far as with, without any uh, more investment because we don't invest much. You're looking at half the company right here. Yep. And so uh, yeah. our overhead is lower than any and company. And your top and door C. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, oh, I'm sorry I missed that. So yeah. pre- prior to yeah. COVID, we we all worked out of a spare bedroom at my parents' house. And uh, we split up for safety reasons for COVID and just, um, you know, we all live in Weatherford, but my brother and I started working from our house and so we set up our offices there. But, but you know this about about business like we didn't know we were going to be here so this isn't this isn't following a a plan where you know what's going to happen just like his education we just you get in that mindset you just got to figure it out every day yep every week there's a new whatever just watch ahead of you and see what see what needs to be done ahead of you i don't have a a long-term plan or program no those challenges never take advantage of everything i see yeah that never changes no and, and, and frankly, you know, people like that and I would get bored, you know, if it got to be routine. Yeah. yeah. That's not what it means to run a business. And you know yeah. that. Well, we've got some, we have some ideas on a drawing board that we haven't been able to get to yet that are, are going to help. But, but just, just to differentiate a little bit, uh, total, total equine, and total canine, any of them, total bull from, from any other product on the market. Uh, there are a couple of things that I think the industry has missed. Um, even, you know, when I bit worked for the huge feed company, they, they wouldn't let me do the things I wanted to do because it wasn't sanctioned by them. Well, I did them anyway, and that's what got me in trouble. But um, the, there are just little things. There, there's nothing big that will make a difference in nutrition and in performance. It's the little thing. Yes, sir. Anybody can make a ration with so much energy and so much protein and so much calcium and so much phosphorus. Okay, that's fine. Everybody does. 
And if they don't, they better go find another job. But it's the little things behind the scenes, if you will, the, the trace minerals, and the seaweed that I use, those, those are the two things that are special. Now, first, well, the extrusion process. Uh, that There's three, three points to my program that make it different. Um, well, the extrusion isn't unique anymore <laughs> because so many people have copied it. But making an extrusion, extruded feed look, looks like fish food. That's what most people call it, or cocoa puffs. A lot of people call it cocoa puffs because it looks just like it and smells like it. Um, that is so soluble in moisture that uh, the minute it hits the stomach, it dissolves. That may not sound critical to a lot of people, but it's absolutely critical to, like, to the horse especially. Uh, I use the horse as the best example. Dogs and so on do too, and we do too. But... Uh, Trace minerals must be absorbed within the first six feet of the small intestine. A lot of people don't understand that. That if, if they're not, there's a, there's a pathway into the bloodstream in that first section of the, the duodenum, which is the first section of the small intestine. There's a pathway. And they have to be uh, able to attach to a carrier protein, if you will, and be a, carried through the intestinal wall. That's how they get in there. But in order to be, do that, they have to be change their chemistry. When when uh, uh, trace minerals are all uh, attached to an oxygen or something, they don't exist by themselves they, because they're electrically charged. Every trace mineral has two positive charges on it, so so it, it's going to attach to something somewhere because uh, it gets in trouble if it's not if, if it's by itself. Some of them will explode because they'll oxidize so fast. When they go into the small, the, the stomach, they go in as a partner with something like that, whether it's an oxide, a sulfate, a amino acid complex, which is simply an amino acid attached to it, loosely attached, or a protein which they attach to or something like that. Once they get into the lower part of the, the stomach, the pH drops from about seven, six and a half or seven in the mouth and early part of the stomach to about two or three, which, boom, it changes dramatically. They let go of whatever they do. They dissociate. All of a sudden, they're a charged particle looking for something to do. And so they, uh, they all become free. When they move into the small intestine, which is still somewhat acidic, and that's why they're absorbed there, that acid environment, they will pick up with that carrier protein, and they will go through the intestinal wall. If they don't, they become fertilizers. They're gone. Because we have 80, around 80, 90 feet of small intestine in a horse to work with. But you only get that six or seven to get the trace minerals in. If those, there's two problems. If those uh, are not released, if they're in a pellet, and a pellet doesn't dissolve very well. It, it goes on down the track before it dissolves. Part some of them will dissolve. Some of them will be they'll chew fine enough, so they'll be, a lot of that will be released. But not all of them are. So a lot of them go on down the track. The other thing is that if you bunch those up and try to get too many at one time in that short period of time, uh, you uh, you're just not going to get enough through the wall. So I use a special trace mineral. It's a chelated trace mineral. Chelates are uh, a chemical form of trace minerals where you take the amino acid, which I use the tiniest little amino acid there is, like glycine. And for people that study nutrition, they would know that that's the smallest one. It holds on to this, and the chelate means a claw in Greek. And so this uh, trace mineral, copper, zinc, whatever, hooks on to a this glycine, which has two negative charges. So, boom, they're locked up. They don't react in the stomach. They don't react in the first part of the small intestine. They don't have to. They go on down the tract, and they are so small, they can go into the bloodstream anywhere in that 70 or 80 feet. Almost 100% efficiency, where the efficiency of some of those trace minerals that they've used over the years is 15 to 20%. 
not very good. And even the best ones are maybe 75 to 85 or so, but still. Well, so they did, the answer there, they just dump more of it in the feed and, and yes. cross your fingers that it gets in right. there. But they, they, they literally aren't going to get more in. Right. Because. You uh, can't force it through that. No. There's only so much can go through. Yeah. Uh, and if they don't get switched in time, they're not going to go. So that's one thing. Then And then the third leg of, the, of my uh, so-called uniqueness is, um, and I've told the public this many times, uh, that it's the seaweed. It's called Ascophyllum nodosum, which is, can you say that real fast? Ascophyllum nodosum. Hey, you're good. <laughs> Hire him. It's no. closer than my dealers get, actually. Yeah, <laughs> both of them can't even say it. <laughs> but anyway, it, uh, this is a special uh, seaweed that grows in Nova Scotia. <laughs> and uh, the research has been done at Texas Tech University, a lot of it over the years. I worked with them years ago on the research and different places, North Dakota State and Virginia Tech and places like that, some really good institutions showing that kills E. coli, salmonella, and hindgut works people too. It's in my total people plus. Always have a clean hindgut. Now, if you can remove those negative bacteria, they're negative to most anything going on. Uh, and you allow room for the positive bacteria, the gram-positive bacteria, to grow more profusely, then they digest fiber much more efficiently than the negative guys. All of a sudden, and this is documented, that with that present in the hindgut, or in the rumen, or in the colon, cecum, and colon of the horse, that the fiber digestion will go up like 17%. Use less fiber. The animal doesn't need as much fiber. They get more out of every bite, so they get by on 15 to 30% less hay when you feed total equine. That's just, uh, I, didn't, I didn't come up with that number. My customers came up with that number. They, yeah, we they didn't, tell me all the time. Between that, I remember those, those two things in the yeah. early days, the hoof growth and the hay reduction, we didn't really believe. And yeah. so we had to go out and document it ourselves with customers, with yeah. cameras and everything we did. Right. And I'm like, I'll be darned. We yeah. stumbled onto something. The and then if you feed enough total equine, you don't have to feed any hay at all. There's another place where we changed the paradigm in the industry. Because if you ask, and I've had people tell me this, and I've had people get really mad at me oh, yeah. about even talking about that. Start a fist fight. Ooh. And, but uh, if you ask any bona fide nutritionist, equine nutritionist to design you a program. They'll say, okay, the first, first thing is we got to have 1.5% of body weight every day in long stem hay. No, they don't. And, and that's where I've gotten in almost fights with some people. Mm. I've had, I've had women just scream at me. And tell well, me it's crazy. I've got, so my horse heard, I've got, three bucking horses and then about eight saddle horses and um <clears throat> they're turned out it's pretty much a lot there's very little grazing out there you know because it's um there's a couple bucking bulls with them you know uh the cow pastures have plenty of grazing but like where i keep these horses there's not any grazing and so all we feed them is uh is is total equine during the during the winter time i'll sometimes put a round bell out not only just again i'm a sympathy feeder but also like it'll give them somewhere to kind of be where it's warm but um uh i've got two horses right now my eldest horse which is 25 years old dollar and then uh, my youngest uh colt birdman they're in there together and a dollar for over a year only total equine only no, like, <clears throat> even when I'm sympathy feeding, he doesn't get hay, yeah. you know, and Birdman as well. Like, they both only get total equine. Okay. So, um, Dollar, he doesn't winter very well, so sometimes, I mean, he'll get upwards of 10 pounds, but most of the time it's around the 8 mark. Um, so, anyhow, I know for sure, like, I've had a, a lot, a lot of horses that, um, and then, 
you know, I've been on it for years and it's been that way. Very, very little hay. And when they do have hay, it's only seasonal. Like maybe when that's like going to snow. And then last well, year, last year I had a, I had a cult, a three-year-old colic and I, <clears throat> and she was asking me about my, my, my program. And she was like, well, you don't feed any hay. And I was like, no, ma'am. And she was like, well, man. And I said, hold on. This is one out of a dozen horses. He's been on the same program for years. Like, I've been on Total Feeds for seven years. So you're telling me that, and she was like, no, I guess if you had something, if another, if it happens to another one, because horses can colic for a number of reasons. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not, it's well, not right. only. And uh, sure enough, we've never had, with you know, over a year, horses on the exact same program have never colic but um <clears throat> it's hard to say why he did that day you know but everything else is fine and always has been so um yeah there's a lot of reasons a horse can can colic but oh, yeah. impaction, they're very very sensitive impaction we cannot stop the impaction all the time and that that's one that gets them in trouble but um if, uh, if someone's feeding four pounds a day and hay uh, in the wintertime and they get an impaction colic, the simple solution is forget the hay, free choice total equine for three or four days, and it's it's The done. other thing is making sure they're getting enough water. Key. Key point. Uh, water deprivation or insufficiency is uh, probably the most common cause See, that, that of it's, it's most impaction. likely that that was his problem. You know, <clears throat> yeah. like he didn't like the tank water or right. something like that, right. you know, and, and, uh, we have a trick for that. I would, right. <laughs> you know, put total feeds in a bucket yeah. and they'll <laughs> yeah. suck it but, down. But, and cause it was in the summertime. And so I oh, would okay. venture to guess that it was most likely something like that rather than, because like I said, like six years, seven years of yep. feeding horses on this stuff, right. like dollar has had hay in front of him like two times in five years, you know, like, I mean, he's, yeah, I, I would, I would venture to guess that, Badger passing from colic is a freak freak accident. Not that Dollar has not had colic being a freak accident. You know what I mean? Right. Anyway, well, and, and again, just to reiterate, you can do that when you feed an animal like Dollar. If you're only going to feed totally equine, it needs to be at least eight pounds. Eight pounds. You yes. can't do three or four pounds. No, no. Eight, only. eight pounds. If you're only going to feed eight to can, ten. If you can feed four, four pounds for total equine. You've got to supplement with hay. Free choice hay. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, but stop the reason, your flakes. So the reason that works, there, there's very good reason why that can work that people don't understand, and that is that uh, there's no raw starch in total equine. And, and raw starch in pellets, sweet feed, whatever, are the reason that horses have digestive problems and why they colic most of the time is gas colic is the uh, raw starch that doesn't get digested in the small intestine gets into the hind gut and starts to ferment really fast. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just t we talked about how total equine accelerates fermentation. Okay, so all of a sudden we have this raw starch get in the hind gut, um, and if you mix the two together, you can really, you can cause it. But just without total equine and just to pellet and feed, the, that starch, if you get a little too much at one time, all of a sudden you get too much gas, you get too much acid, and you get colic and founder, because founder, Typically, the, the main reason of, of, of feed colic is that it causes uh, excess lactic acid production in the hind gut, which causes a vasoconstriction in the body. Mm -hmm. Now, total equine causes vasodilation, big time. And so we prevent, literally, uh, you can say we prevent colic, I mean prevent founder, because uh, they, it doesn't allow that uh, those blood vessels to constrict and reduce the blood flow to the foot, which is, uh, you reduce blood flow to that foot, you're gonna have problems right away. It, it doesn't take long at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, it'll happen in 24, 48 hours. But uh, the, uh, uh, so, so we not only prevent the founder, but like I was saying, we had customers telling us in early days about how all of a sudden they were growing a brand new set of hooves every five months. And I said, no, impossible. No, you, you got, send us pictures. Yeah. Yeah. You, I don't buy that. They didn't like me calling them a liar. Yeah. 
So they proved it. They said, well, I'll prove it to you. They yep. would get a, a horse, and when they're going to start it on, they'd score the hairline. In five months, that score was going. Yep. I said, okay, I believe you. <laughs> yep. And that's another benefit is the quality of, of hoof, prevention of hoof problems. Uh, farriers love the horses that are on total equine because, first of all, they're, they're easier to trim. They have a, a softer hoof but a tougher hoof. If that can be two together, they're not brittle. <clears throat> right, brittle. Yeah. A, a hard they're brittle hoof is no good. Right, 100%. And this, you know, this is, a, again, you're, he's tackling a problem. You, you know, there's all kinds of aftermarket treatments and stuff, but he's tackling it from right. the inside right. with nutrition. Which makes sense. Yep. Yeah. So we usually end each podcast with um, life advice. So I'd be interested to hear what advice you might have for an entrepreneur and I'll let you think about it. Donnie, what do you have for life advice? Man, I thought of this the other day. Um, it really, it came to my mind. It, it, uh, don't, don't sweat the, the petty things and don't pet the sweaty things. Yeah. My I, man. I came up with that. <laughs> so insightful. Yeah. Really. So insightful. <laughs> Love it. Yep. That's great. What Thank do you, you have for Thank you? you. <laughs> I don't, don't think that you have to have a plan. Uh, get up re- every day ready to accept and meet your challenges. Yep. Your life will be so much easier. I've been on a C.S. Lewis qu- uh, kick. So in a recent book, he said, uh, in the end, there's only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And then those to who God says in the end, thy will be done. So <laughs> Ooh. think about that one. Yeah, Heavy. Yeah. <laughs> be thinking about that all the way home. <laughs> that's, I've been thinking about it ever since I read it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's uh that one hit me hit me pretty what hard. What book's that from? Um The Great Divorce. Yeah. He's got a couple. He's got a couple Mere books. Christianity, <laughs> screw tape letters, The Great Divorce. The Great Divorce is it's a it's a it's more of a story, theological fiction, mm-hmm. kind of like the Screw Tape Letters, and it's just it kind of describes a man taking a bus. He goes on he rides a bus from hell to heaven, meets his like mentor in heaven, and uh, anyhow, it's a pretty good book. But <laughs> um, so from the man himself, what do you have for us? Well, uh, to me, uh, it's very simple. Find something you really believe in, a product, a program, whatever it is. Don't listen to critics. Put your head down. Don't ever slow up and back off. And uh, overnight success may take 15, 20 years. <laughs> that, <laughs> but that, it'll come. like that part. <laughs> I like that. <clears throat> um, well, Ask your local feed store uh, where you can get total equine, total feeds, threaten to leave them if they don't um, try to get it themselves. Um, <clears throat> just really uh, put the clamps on your local feed, or, uh, feed store to, to get total equine for your horse. You will not regret it. I know all the horses and uh, bulls here at Radiator Ranch, um, even the beef that we will soon be getting processed to consume are on uh, total bull. So um, yeah, check them out and check out total feeds on all things, social media. Yes. We've on a lot of social media and go to totalfeeds.com. Totalfeeds.com. You Simple. actually put your phone number on the bags. You S- can talk yes. to, yes. Uh, you can talk to the man behind <laughs> the, I don't, there's, I don't know of any other company. Nah. That does that. The Much president less of the company. company. Yeah. That's good. You want to hear straight from the president of the company, just <laughs> buy a bag of feed and it has his phone number on it. You believe um, it or not, he loves people calling like, you know what? I got this problem with my horse. He's all ears. Yep. And you're you're <laughs> and you're a morning person, so Yes. Yeah. Don't yeah. don't don't call before five AM. And don't call <laughs> after five PM. <laughs> right yeah. five to five yeah. that's what you got i will only work half days yeah, yeah. half days well <laughs> yeah blue blue plate special and then it's off to bed 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on to the next one. You guys start feeding total feeds and consuming total people plus. Otherwise, you ain't no cowboy.